For those who don't know me, my name is Joe Laskota. I'm the chairman of the Automotive Marketing Department at Northwood University. Northwood, by the way, is the only university in the entire world that offers a dual degree in automotive marketing and management. No one else does what we do. Uh, we, so we get a lot of sons and daughters of dealers, and we have a lot of uh, students who just want to get into the auto industry. Uh, we've been very blessed over the last five years. We've had 100% career placement upon graduation, immediately upon graduation. And I don't think anyone else can boast of that uh, type of record especially during recession. So the car business, uh, contrary to what we hear about uh, all the massive layoff stuff, uh, they're hiring like crazy. The average student in uh, the United States, a college student, graduated with an income of about $27,000, which is not a whole lot of money. Uh, the average uh, automotive marketing major Northwood graduated right around 46000 this past year. So they come out of the, uh, out of the shoot with some pretty decent salaries. Uh, today we're uh, going to be covering a uh, trying to keep up with the competition. This was probably one of the most difficult uh, sessions I've had to try to come up with. When Georgia asked me to come up with this, uh, and she's had this topic in mind, uh, I guess for six months I kind of mulled over what is it that I would, would talk about. And I got to tell you, I came back to one circle. Uh, there's a lot of trainers out there, there's a lot of instructors out there who would like to try to impress you with a lot of new information and uh, so on and so forth. But however, I think when you walk out the door, you want something you can actually implement and take a look at in the real live world. Uh, I'm kind of, a, I, I guess, a conservative individual looking at business and what has happened to us over the last couple of years. In terms of the recession, uh, there's certainly that slight possibility we could have a double dip recession. We're certainly looking at the unemployment at uh, 9%. We're still looking at a housing market that's totally unstable, uh, especially after we take a look at uh, what Fannie Mae has got left of about 786,000 homes that our government owns. That's not going to be pretty. So we've got a still a shaky uh, environment yet. So I think today's session, I would rather focus on what we can do to still stay alive for at least one more year. Uh, I don't believe we're going to hit any kind of major recovery until at least uh, one year where we'll start seeing an, an upswing. The good news is you're here. That means you've had a pretty decent year and you're able to duck and cover and survive. Uh, unfortunately, there are others who have not. And because they probably didn't take as a conservative slash and aggressive approach as they need to, to take. You do have some competition this year. I'd like to kind of talk about who that competition really is. And after six months of contemplating, reviewing all my notes, going back through everything and find a Wall Street Journal and so on and so forth, and using all the sources I had, uh, there's seats right up here. There's four of them. Actually, five seats over here, and we've got two up front. <coughs> so please make yourself comfortable. In terms of our competitors, certainly it could be the independent dealer that's up the street. And whether or not that's true or not, that's up to you. But certainly we've got uh, less independence we've had before. I think in the last, uh, gosh, when I first came to NIADA, we had about 45,000 independents uh, licensed throughout the United States. And I believe right now we're pretty close to about 39,000 independents. But you look at the franchise side, uh, gosh, six uh, years ago we had about 24,000 uh, franchise dealers, and now we're down to approximately uh, 19,000 uh, franchise dealers. So we've had uh, quite a shakeup uh, in this industry which means uh, competition is getting more and more fierce. The good news, however, is your profit margins should rise. As you have less dealers around, uh, our profit margins should go up. The only thing I find disappointing is that uh, gross, gross profits uh, per car sold has not risen as it should have. Right now, in the franchise dealer, uh, he can boast right around $2,286 front end gross. Uh, that's a rise from about $1,500. So you have to ask yourself, where am I compared to the franchise dealer? So the franchise dealer, 2286, uh, the last number I just looked at, that's front end gross only, not the back end. Back end runs around $800. So ask yourself, what's happened to my gross? You have less competition, yet our gross necessarily has not risen accordingly. Certainly you're paying more for cars, but it doesn't matter what you pay, it's what you can sell them for and how you're selling. And I think that's really where I wanted to focus today was uh, how to get and understand the competitive market and find ways to increase your gross profit and survive in a market where we can't guarantee you any more seen contacts. There's chances of us really looking at what you all want. Everyone wants more seen contacts. Everyone says, if I had more traffic, I'd sell more cars. And if I had cars I could buy right, I'd sell more. No, no kidding. Who, who would not be in that situation? The fact of the matter is, we could give you more traffic and you might not even increase your sales. 
Uh, it's a matter of what you do with that traffic. The franchise dealer, uh, they finally got into the used car market. These were guys who you got your cars from. They were glad to get rid of them. Uh, today, out of all of the gross that a new franchise dealer makes, that's from new car, used car, parts, service, and body shop, 32% all of their gross comes from new car sales, and that's it. So if really, we look at the new car department. The new car department, for the most part, is not a money maker for a franchise dealer, and nor will it be for quite some time. They're going to have to make their money off of used cars, parts, and service. And as an independent, I think uh, some of you have learned that you picked up your business by actually getting into the service business as well. Two seats on the end over here that are available. Okay, uh, You have the World Wide Web as competition. Some of you are still struggling with what to do with that information. Uh, there are several dealers who have absolutely done extremely well uh, through eBay and some other sources. Uh, some of you have grasped onto social uh, networking. I gotta tell you, I, I've always had a question about this, the social media. Dealers who are trying to figure out the competition by wanting to tweet, wanting to Twitter, wanting to Facebook. And uh, I gotta tell you, over the last three years, I can't find, I cannot find anywhere and I tell you, I look very hard. It's what I do. I can't find anywhere where social networking has improved car sales. I find that people like you. They like to tweet you. They like to talk to you. They like the little clubs you have. But I can't find one shred of evidence where social networking has actually increased car sales. Now, I'm hopeful that uh, perhaps some of you will uh, meet me later on and say, hey, for us, when we start Twittering, people start buying from us like crazy. <laughs> and I'd like to hear that story. I can't find it. I just can't find it anywhere. But if you have it, I'd like to listen to it. I'm not against it, but I think we're in combat conditions right now. We're looking for ways to sell cars and make money. We have a little bit of competition from the private seller, not as much as we used to, but there is some private competition uh, where the one guy is selling one car next to the other. And we do have some curb stoners out there. And of course, you also have wholesalers who are competing against you as well. So, who do you think the real competitor is in your dealership? Who do you think the real competition is? It's you. <laughs> I think we really take a look at it. I think the true competition that's out there, there's seats right up here. If you like, we have seats right over here up against this wall. I think the real competition, after six months reviewing how I was going to address this, everything came back to you. Because I still find amongst my clients and amongst many of the independents that are out there and franchise dealers, we're still struggling against ourselves and what to do with ourselves as we look to find better ways, faster ways, or simply grasping at straws in the next new gig and hopefully the next new bullet that's out there. And quite frankly, I don't think it's out there yet. So, is competition healthy? Absolutely. If you take a look at uh, golf pro players, they'll tell you they got better when they were against tough competition. If you take a look at any business that struggles, it's when there is no competition. We want a big boy in our neighborhood. That makes us better. It doesn't make us worse. So competition is healthy. We need to have it. But stop chasing it. And that's one of the mistakes I think we make, that we chase the competitor. And we try to out-advertise, out-market, have better coffee, better beignets, bigger, better cookies in our stores. And we try to do all these things to chase the competition. The fact of the matter is, it's doing nothing but costing you a lot of money. Take a look at yourself. And what are you really capable of producing and doing in your own market without chasing the, the competitor up the street? So stop worrying about the competitor. Start worrying about yourself. Quit worrying about the guy up the street and what he's doing what he's not doing. Quit trying to get some information and espionage and find out what they're up against. You're up against yourself. So take a look at yourself. What are you good at? What are you really, really good at? What do you do well? What was it that you did well in the past that you're no longer doing? So what was I really good at? You know what? We're not doing it anymore. We used to. Have you ever had the conversation with your employees? How you used to do something? And now you question, why aren't we doing that any longer? What is it that we're not doing that we possibly could do a much better job at doing? And some of these things are really not phenomenal. But think about, you're not doing a bad job. What is it that got you where you are today? What brought you here in the first place? And has any of those things that you've done in the past, are they eroding and getting weaker? Simply because you're trying to do too many things. Quite frankly, I found yourselves getting tired. In an effort to keep your expenses down, 
you took on some responsibilities you once gave away. You're the chief cook, bottle wash, dishwasher, toilet scrubber, mail goer, bank getter, closer, inventory getter, and reconditioner. You're 17 people once again. You're not 21 anymore. <laughs> and it's killing you. As a matter of fact, you're so busy trying to survive by cutting that expense, you're missing the big picture. I think that's the danger. You're so busy trying to stay alive every day by doing everything yourself, eating at your desk, going home and eating later. Look at yourself. Have you gained weight? Look at yourself. Have you picked up any new disease? <laughs> All I'm suggesting is you think about in your attempts to save money, you actually are preventing yourself from growing. And rethink your strategy of your employers, of your employees. How many do you have? How many do you need? What have you really saved by letting some people go? And have you actually gotten worse since you let people go? Think about it. And ask yourself, when did you become complacent? When did you accept average and mediocrity as OK? When did you first accept that? Remember the old days how you used to scream, rant, and rave when the front line didn't look so straight? You'd go out there and scream, rant, and rave. The front line wasn't straight. Remember that? Remember how you used to become an animal when the stickers weren't on right? Remember how you used to just scream and rant and rave at the porter because the back stickers weren't straight or on the car? When did you stop screaming? Think about it. Remember when you first got your store and it opened it up? How you were just annoyed when the paperwork wasn't right, the bathrooms were dirty, the light bulb was burned out? How many have burned out today? When did you become complacent? When you think about competitiveness, oftentimes the first line defense is let's spend more money on advertising. Now, there is a difference between advertising and promotion, but are you choosing to spend more on advertising and promotion as a way of competing, or are you spending money internally to improve upon things you need to improve internally? Think about it. Have you spent more on advertising? Have you tried newer advertising, like the social networking? That didn't quite give you what you wanted, so you throw more money at it. Where are you spending your money? How are you spending that money? Or are you, and think about how much money have you spent internally on training people? When's the last time you spent money on yourself? When's the last time you spent money training and developing your employees? Think about it. Do you have salespeople telling the same story they did 26 years ago, 15 years ago, or five years ago? Do you have salespeople trying to close deals the same way they did five years ago? You can't close deals today like you did before. There's too much information out there. Customers have way too much information. But you might be allowing the same things you've done for years and years and years to go on, and you're throwing money in the wrong department. How much money have you spent this past year on customer retention? We spent a lot of time, energy, and effort trying to get brand new customers into our dealership. Yet when it comes down to the bottom line, we oftentimes spend nothing or next to nothing on retaining the customers that we already have, who will buy from you again. How much money have you spent getting people after three, four, five years of having your vehicle to come back all over again to you? Or have you allowed yourself to keep chasing the elusive new customer, the fewer customers that are out there, and ignore the nucleus, the base that brought you there? This, I think, is one of our greatest opportunities right here is spending more on customer retention strategies, and I'll show you why in a little bit. Or have you stuck your head in the sand and said, let's not do anything, the market will recover, there's nothing I can do about it anyway. Guys are kind of like that anyway. You know, you feel bad and just know it, it'll go away. It doesn't, but we kind of, we're positive people. We believe that things will take care of itself, because that's how we are. And the fact of the matter is, we head out of sand and we've got to start doing something differently than what we're currently doing. So, ask yourself, which of these did you do this year? There is a difference, and there, unfortunately, we spent a lot of time, energy, and effort on customer satisfaction. I have nothing against customer satisfaction, 
but there most certainly is a difference between customer satisfaction and customer loyalty. And if you think about all the things you did last year, ask yourself the question, what have I done to improve customer satisfaction? And if you did a lot of things, give yourself a pat on the back. You sent them out cookies and you sent out newsletters. You want to keep people happy. But I share with you there's a tremendous difference between these two. Which one do you think you really want? Customer loyalty. The difference is, see, with customer loyalty, CSI, customer satisfaction, that's a measurement of a customer's attitude, how they feel, happy, sad. That's all that is. So when we talk about customer satisfaction, all you're doing is talking about an attitude. And it's an attitude that doesn't necessarily get you repeat business. Think about all the places that you were satisfied with, you just never went back there. Restaurants, shoe stores, clothing stores. You can't say anything bad about the people, you just had no reason to go back to them. Did nothing wrong, you felt warm and fuzzy about them, just had no reason to go back. And I think that's one of the mistakes we made when we look at a competitive market, we spend a lot of time on customer satisfaction versus customer loyalty. And customer loyalty measures behavior. How are customers behaving towards you? Referring people to you, buying from you again and repeatedly. So I share with you, as you take a look at conversations you're holding with your employees, there's a seat right here, we have a couple. As you take a look at your employees, what message are you really giving them? Are you telling them to keep customers happy, warm, and fuzzy, or are we thinking about let's find ways to get customers to actually refer people back to us? When we look at customer loyalty, customer loyalty represents a non-random behavior. Or CSI is random, buy from you, don't buy from you where customer loyalty is a non-random behavior. They buy from you for a particular purpose. They buy from you for a particular reason. Now what that is, you have to figure out. Why do people want to buy from you over and over and over again? What reason is there for them to buy from you over and over again? So we look at customers who are loyal, they're very biased. That's the only place I'll go to. That's the only hairstylist I'll go to. That's the only restaurant I'll eat at during lunch. That's the only type of pants I'll wear. It's the only type of shoes I'll ever buy. They're very biased. That's the only computer I'll ever own. I'll not own nothing less than an Apple. That's a biased opinion. So ask yourself, do your customers have a biased opinion about you? So their purchase decision is not random at all. There's a reason for doing it. Is it the service? Is it the price? Is the process? What is the reason for them to want to come back to you repeatedly? And they purchase from a business at least twice. So of all the customers that you sold the vehicle to last year, and some of you had a pretty decent year, some of you had a year that was better than even last year, have you sat down and analyzed of all the sales I made last year, how many of those bought from me in the past? You need to know that answer. Because that answer needs to be greater than 30%. That answer needs to be greater than 55%. So if all of the customers you sold last year, if 55% or actually less than 55% of the customers who bought from you last year, you have an opportunity to improve in a competitive market. Getting the people to buy from you again and again and again. But please keep in mind, Retained customers aren't necessarily loyal. You just have them, but they're not going to buy from you again necessarily. Why is that? Well, you see, you may be the only dealer in the area. And that's why you got to sell them again. No one else is within a reasonable time uh, frame of travel. So you know what? I got to buy from you. It's kind of like the, the one restaurant in the area. Everyone eats there, not because it's good food. It's the only place in town. So what happens is you may be the lesser of two evils. So that's why I have to take a look at why are customers buying from you? Not just that they are, but why are they buying from you? Do you really know that answer? You just may be, and the reason why your, your gross is low, because that's your reputation. The only reason why they buy from you is just your gross. You're not really good. You just have to be the cheapest guy on the block. And I'm not sure that's really the way to survive in a highly competitive market, just being the cheapest guy on the block. So when you take a look at your strategy for this year, you take a look at are you going for 
a market share strategy, which is typical of what a dealership does, I did it, other dealers have done it, looking at market share, or are you looking at loyalty strategy? See, and your goal in a market share strategy is getting people to switch from ABC dealer to you. That's a hard one to do. So if you're looking just at market share, you're spending an awful lot of time, energy, and effort getting people to switch versus a loyalty strategy, getting people to buy from you because they're loyal. And what are the reasons for loyalty? There may be nothing I can do in a market condition on either one of these categories because we have low growth and a saturated market. When you think about your focal point in a market share strategy, it's all about competition. Try and knock the other guy out. Trophy sales, conquest sales, those are expensive. You give away a lot of gross and you overpraise in a conquest type of market. Versus one of which you're simply trying to retain customers. And how do you measure that in a market share strategy? Are you looking at it as a market relative to the competition or customer retention? See, we can say, I beat the guy up the street. We're the best in town. We outsell the other two guys. And that's one way of measuring it. But it may not be the most effective and high gross way to do business when you take a look at, you know what? We sell out of cars, but we don't keep anybody. So you're always chasing after that new customer, which is very expensive. So if the market does not change this year, and it probably won't, all economic indicators are we're here for another year, which is not so terrible. You're used to it now. But what can I do? It's time to really take a critical look at your processes inside the dealership. When I visit dealerships throughout the US and Canada, I find that oftentimes it's not about people being bad people. I find that it's not a matter of bad processes. I find oftentimes it's a lack of processes. We wake up and just say, today's the day we DB do business. Sell cars, do business, and that fixes everything. As a matter of fact, I used to say it, you probably have said it, you know what solve our problems? Just sell more cars. All right? You sell more cars, we're happy. The fact of the matter is, some of you actually sold more cars and making more money. Because it is mathematically possible to sell more cars you've ever sold before and still not make another nickel and actually make less. So, when you take a look at sales promotions, just because you've got a gorilla on the roof doesn't mean someone's gonna go, hot damn, there's that gorilla, today's the day. <laughs> I was hoping that gorilla would be out there. And has anyone really ever heard someone say, I would not have bought a car today had I not seen your gorilla? And the gorilla made me do it. And when your competitor has a gorilla, do you buy two? <laughs> and a dinosaur? And when you think about all these sales promotions, what happens is you're actually educating your customers and getting them to focus on one thing. What's that? Price. Monthly payments and price. Monthly payments and price. Monthly payments and price. That's all a promotion does. So instead of getting customers to focus on you, focus on the relationship, focus on the business, we accidentally cause them to focus on price. And I think GM, Ford, Chrysler are very indicative of that. They could not discount, rebate, or incentive enough. You never hear anyone talk about how great the GM, Ford, or Chrysler product was. They only talk about no cash down, low monthly payments, 0% financing, but you never heard him say what a great vehicle it was. So we're looking at building loyalty. We look at companies that chose to build their loyalty on price, those companies are traditionally short-lived. Now Walmart does promise one thing, but they've always been consistent at it, and what's that? Low price. Come heck or high water, but they've never changed from that. They've never deviated from that. When we think about other products that sell, this is not about price. Although I finally saw one of the shops down the, uh, the forum there what a Rolex really cost. I was embarrassed that it cost more than my Toyota. <laughs> I just asked the guy how much the payments would be, including the late fee. <laughs> 
At which point he took me to the yeah, and the grill. At which point he took me to the Timex. <laughs> but when you really think about what motivates people to buy consistently, and that loyalty, it's value selling. So what is it about your particular dealership that offers value selling? And what's the story your salespeople tell about you? So we look at price. You want to look at value. We want people to stay in our product. The more people stay in our product, the more they use the product, the more loyal they become. So one of the things we've got to do is find ways for people to not just use our cars, but to enjoy using the cars and to get maximum value out of using that car. I try to talk to dealers about accessorizing used cars. How many of you actually accessorize used cars that you sell? Not many. But when you think about it, when customers leave you, do you not think they accessorize it? Why don't you do that? What accessories, do you really know what accessories your customers are putting on cars they buy from you? The next time a customer buys a car from you and comes back a couple weeks later to make that payment, see what they've added or changed on that car. Then ask yourself, could I not have done that? As a matter of fact, that customer went out there and put that accessory on the car. How did they pay for it? MasterCard or Visa? At what interest rate? 22%? 23%? When will they pay that off? Never. 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 Why would you allow a customer to do that? Why would you not sell your customers accessories that they can actually pay for at a reasonable interest rate, whatever they're charging on the car, and guarantee it'll be paid off and increase the value of the vehicle? We want people to use our cars and pick up extra gross profit through accessory sales. If you don't believe that, go to Walmart. Look how many accessories they sell. Look at the accessory houses around you and the accessories they sell. You don't think about doing that. But that's a way of creating a customer loyalty. Don't let me go to Walmart and put on my MasterCard at 22%. That's hurting me. Because I'll never pay for those wheels, ever. So the more we get customers using the product, that's why we keep cars running. When someone has a mechanical problem, we want to make sure that we fix that problem and find a way to keep that car running. Because if it's not being used, they're finding ways to be dissatisfied. <clears throat> so think about it. Of all the services you have, think about all the services you do have. Do you detail cars? Do you offer detail service to your customers? You have service departments. Have you found ways to encourage customers to use your service departments? Why are you allowing them to go up the street? In other words, we've got to find ways to utilize all that you've spent money on so far today. Give people reason to come back to you. Financing services, mechanical services, reconditioning services. How about advising people? You have a record of their car, how long they've been driving it, and if you're really smart, you also know how many miles are on that car and how many miles they continue to place on that car. We have seats available right here. So ask yourself the question, have I called my customers up earlier than I should have to advise them now is a better time to trade before the odometer clicks over again? You become their financial advisor in driving. Mr. Customer, you're driving a particular car where the market has risen. This may be an ideal time for you to trade out early to maximize the value of your vehicle. We actually can put you in something a little newer with little to no increase in monthly payments because of the market the way it is today. And by the way, is that possible to do? Absolutely. Absolutely. So you think about a customer getting a phone call from you as opposed to, hey, come on in, we just put another gorilla up. <laughs> Our records indicate you probably have about 63,000 miles on your car. Is that correct? How close am I? You know, your car, the market value, has risen dramatically. What that means to you is, we probably can put you in another vehicle, newer vehicle, better gas mileage vehicle, with more accessory vehicle, for about the same amount of monthly payments you're paying right now. Would that be of interest to you? That's the type of sales calls you guys should be making, not, hey, come on in, we've got a sale going on, we've got hot dogs tomorrow. Think about it. Becoming a financial advisor for people. 
You know, there was a video that was created, had it by a used car. Any of you ever used that in high schools yet? Good, because it's free, you don't want to do that. You have all these tools. When's the last time you've been to a high school to teach kids about FICO scores? When's the last time you're in a high school teaching students about how to buy a used car? When's the last time you reached out to your community other than the supporting the baseball team and soccer team? Those are nice things to do. But think about the educational value that's missing in your relationship with your local high school. How many cars have you sold as a result of you giving away or supporting your baseball team? How many more cars do you think you'll sell if you really became a, an advisor at a high school level? Because guess what? High schools are cutting out educational programs like that. There's no room to budget for it. What's that? It's online, it's free. And idea has it for free, how to buy a used car. Can you imagine going to high school and making that type of offer? They can't offer that type of program in a public school system. There is no budget for it. You could do it free of charge and with great publicity, free publicity. Colleges, educating college students, a lot of college students don't have the information on how to buy a used car because they weren't taught that in high school. And I can tell you from experience, because I teach college students, many are unfamiliar with FICO scores or Beacon scores. They're not sure. They've heard the word, maybe, but many have no idea how it gets there. That's where you come in. Certainly, you can mail. That gets very little response. We look at maybe one half of 1%. Internet, a little bit better way of communicating with people because of such a large number of research that's done via the internet. But if you're waiting for me to call you, that's very foolish. Your job is to reach out to the consumer. Just because you put an ad in the paper, just because you're on the internet, doesn't mean people should call you. How many deals? There's 39,000 of you. I don't need to call you. You need to be reaching out to me and separating yourself from the crowd by identifying who I am in the first place. That's how you win in a competitive market, is come to me. Just because you have a sign out there and just because you've got a building doesn't mean I'm going to find you. Make my job easier. With a 51% higher divorce rate in this country, when you think about all the time we don't have, how easy can you make it, how easy should you make it for me to be able to do business with you? Think about time-saving ways to compete in this market. Do you have a body shop? Do you have a tie into a body shop? Do you have a tie into a towing company? You don't have to own your own towing truck. That's expensive. And if you don't have it, do you have a relationship that customers have a full service? If they need something, it's guaranteed you can take care of it. So when we look at customer loyalty over CSI. We're looking at ways to reduce overall marketing costs. We're looking for ways to reduce your overall transaction costs. And we're looking for ways to reduce customer turnover. We can't afford to lose any customers, ladies and gentlemen. Granted, in some markets, we've got a lot of elderly customers, and you're going to lose them. That's just the way it is. You might be in an area with a military base. It's difficult to have customer retention in a military town because of soldiers moving in and moving out. But think about the customers we can keep. This is where you'll make your gross profits, right here. And granted, everyone, every one of us has a story about customers who like us, but do you have enough of those stories? Are you still operating back in 1956 hours? Because that's the way your small town is. We shut down early. You know, oftentimes I want to do business with a company, but I can't find you. You're not open. You're closed when I need you. I work till 5. You close at 6. I need you on Saturday. You close at noon. I'm still doing baseball with my kid. Sunday's the number one shopping day in the U.S. Granted, for religious reasons, for many of us, we're not going to be open on Sunday. And I'm not going to disagree with that. I like that even close on Sunday. Unfortunately, it's the number one shopping day in the United States. So can you compensate, if you're going to close on Sunday, for longer hours throughout the weekday? Just ask yourself, when's the last time we re really reevaluated our hours of operation? And do they truly make sense? Or are you still operating your hours of operation to make your employees happy? I don't want happy employees. <laughs> I'd be much happier if they were friggin' miserable. And we were making a lot of money being miserable. 
But think about the hours that they really, really work and what's being done during those hours. Hours of operation. I can tell you this from a project I work with the Chrysler Corporation. When we increase the service department hours, we open longer on Saturday, we open longer in the evening. Within less than six months, those dealerships that change their hours of operation to longer increase their business by 30%. If you don't believe that, take a look at Sears. When is Sears open? Can you get your, uh, get a car service at Sears on Sunday? Can you get your car service at Sears past 7 p.m.? How about Walmart? How about Manny, Mo, and Mac? How about Jiffy Lube? <coughs> Guess where you are? Closed. Vision. My, my employees love me. We're happy. Yep. So we think about this purchase cycle. When customers purchase from us, and they'll get to us either through our advertising, marketing, promotion, internet, word of mouth, and whatever creativity we have around the dealership, they ask themselves, after they buy from you, they ask themselves, did I really enjoy that experience? Where we lose customers is many times right here is the post-purchase decision. Do they regret buying from you? Is there any buyer's remorse? And as time goes on, they look at another decision to repurchase, and who is it going to be from, and then hopefully make that other purchase. So this is the most vulnerable area that you have. And ask yourself the question, what are we really doing in our time period where customers get that first monthly payment? Because that's when buyer's remorse sets in. Buyer's remorse sets in within 30 to 45 days because that's the first payment that's due and the fun is over. That's when you wake up going, holy crap, what did I do? Kind of like after you get married. <laughs> You've had the honeymoon, the reception, the gifts were opened. A few months later, oh my God, <laughs> what did I do? You wake up, they're still there. <laughs> Buyer's remorse. <laughs> My wife's not here, I could say that. <laughs> the rest of you guys are seri serious faces on. Your wife's next to you, I know. <laughs> I don't believe that, sweetheart. I always loved you. <laughs> Look at your customer database. When was the last time you really analyzed your customer database and freshened it up? Are you still sending out the mail to dead people? When you send out mailings and it comes back undeliverable, what do you do with that piece? We send it back to them. Just one more time. It may not be really dead. <laughs> but you might throw it out. If you do throw the piece out, which you go probably throw it out, did you change your database to reflect the mail coming back? Did you do that? You should. But I find many times when a customer's mail comes back as undeliverable, no longer at this address, you simply discard it. Because you didn't receive it in the first place, someone in the business office received it. And they said, ah, dead person. Didn't tell anyone, so we continue to have bad data in the database. So you really want to take a look at how good is the information in my database to begin with. I always talk about permission marketing. I don't know how to reach you. You certainly don't want to call me because I don't answer the phone. I don't like the phone, number one. Number two, I'm in meetings like this a lot of the time. In classroom, I'm not. So I don't answer the phone. The best way to reach me is through email or text me. If you mail me something, I'm not home that often to get it in a timely fashion. So ask me, the consumer, how I like to be contacted. So when you're talking to me, don't just ask me for my name, my address, my phone number. Ask. How do you like to be communicated with? You might have to have four different ways of setting up to communicate with your customers. But at least you'll reach them. Think about your business and ways to improve gross profit. Do you know the average consumer does not know they're supposed to change windshield wiper blades every six months? Did you know you're supposed to? Windshield wiper blades have a life, regardless, by the way, of how much you pay for them. Regardless of how expensive they are, or if they're X blades, X super deluxe blades, 
they last six months. So quite frankly, the average consumer get away with an average set of blades. Did you ever think about calling your customers up to remind them, hey, it's six months, change, change your blades? Why would you do that anyway? Maybe to sell them some blades, but why would you do it? What's that? Keep your name in front of them. Think about that. If I get a call from you to remind me to change my stupid windshield wiper blades, it just says you care. It just says you know about me. And you know what? You probably can save my life. Because usually the only time people change their blades is when? It makes that cut across the glass. Right? Or that one piece of rubber slap in the windshield. Have you thought about changing your oil to a winter oil? Many customers aren't aware they might should change to a winter oil. You have service departments. In other words, keep in touch with me. Don't send me a coupon for an oil change. Tell me why I should change my oil. Give me a logical reason to make that oil change, other than your coupon. Because when you send me the coupon, all you do is give up gross, don't you? So when we think about which is easier, always going out there trying to find the new customer or retaining the customer you already have. For those of you who are married and divorced four or five times, you know it was cheaper the first time. Love the one you're with. So when you think about your customers, it's cheaper to keep than it is to find new ones. There's some lawyer in here going, there goes my business. <laughs> the trick is finding out who your existing customers are and understanding your database. Do you realize you have customers who haven't bought from you in uh, three, four, five years? You don't even know who they are? You have, you're so busy chasing the new customer as I did, I didn't pay attention to the customers I lost. So I try to show every opportunity I have. When you look at advertising, this certainly may be an exaggeration in dollars depending upon your market or less. But when you think about every single customer that you've been chasing in a highly competitive market, what is the dollar value of every single human being that you have contact with? Of all the money you're spending, do you really know how many customers it actually has brought to your door? Or prospects, potential customers it's brought to your door? Are you measuring that? In a highly competitive market, you need to know not only what you're spending, but how effective is it? Because quite frankly, when you take a look at this customer here who left your dealership because no one followed up with me, if I've got a net retention in my dealership of 4%, I've got to generate $1,500 in sales for every customer I lose, or prospect I lose. What's it costing you every time a salesperson doesn't turn a customer over to you? What does it cost you every time you fail to follow up with a prospect that you already had an opportunity to, to work? What's it costing you? If you don't know the answer, today's the day you begin learning what that answer is. And put a dollar value to every single consumer that touches your doorway. 4% net on sales? I was generous this year. The last reported number uh, six weeks ago uh, was 2.7. It was 2.7. I stretched for the one guy in the room going, I'm at six. So when you think about what has happened, I say, well, how do you compete in a competitive market? Quit chasing the guy up the street and think about, should I be chasing myself? This number hasn't changed in years. A typical dealership closes only 19% of all customers that walk into the dealership. That's it. Now, for those of you who boast and brag that you're a little bit better than that, chances are you're not looking at all the data and you're getting half of the information anyway. But the fact of the matter is, I wanted to try to find out, and this, by the way, was pretty typical too, when I did some research and finding out how effective we were and what percentage of unsold guests are actually being able to be brought into a dealership. What I found out in the United States over the last two years, a typical dealership, not because they can't, not because they cannot, but because they choose not to, only close or get back 25%, only get back 25% of the customers who leave them through follow-up. That's it. So what I try to get my clients to do is, if you only did a few things, one, become better closers, two, do a better job on following up with people, what would happen to you? And here, I decided not to change any of this because right now we're, 
we went from a 19% close rate, it jumps to 50%, which is not a big surprise. If you can get customers to come back, they're much easier to close. The fact of the matter is your greatest opportunity in a competitive market is right here. So ask yourself, what methodology are we using to get customers to come back, those who came and visited us and left? And your answer is, we send them a letter. We send them a thank you. That'll do it. Just because you send me a thank you doesn't mean I'm going back to you. It's a nice gesture, but there's no reassurance I'm going to go back to you. So how effective can you be, how effective, more effective can you be in getting customers to come back after they leave? Because they're going somewhere. Because if you made a phone call three days later to Mr. Customer, you visited us three days ago, I want to see if you bought anything. Oh, you did. Well, I hope you'll keep us in mind the next time. What's that, about five years from now? Remember me. How many of your salesmen ever called customers up who've been in only to get, oh, you did? That's the call you have to stop and find ways of reaching those customers earlier. What I wanted to show you is right here. And as I create a simulation to show dealers, and I show this in my CMD class now. I want to show you what would happen if we did just a better job in doing the fundamentals. What I did was I created a simulation that says, you know what, let's not increase how many cars you have in stock. I'm not asking you to do that. These represent, uh, by the way, these numbers actually are from real dealerships. Uh, I took 500 dealerships and took the, uh, these are very profitable stores. And uh, these were average inventories I had. I didn't change anything. I'm not going to change anything up in here. The only thing I'm going to change is, as a matter of fact, I didn't even change how many guests walk in the dealership. The average dealership of these numbers, they had 212 people walk in their dealership. I said, okay, what if we can't get any more people to walk in? What would happen if we just did a better job with those that do walk in? So right now, as I shared with you earlier, we are about 19% as an industry. So I ask you, what would be a reasonable number to change here that you think you could measure and manage? What would be a reasonable number to increase it by? Well, if I said to you, you're at 19%, what would you say, you know what, Joe, if I leave here, I promise you we're going to work towards this percentage. What would that be? 25%. I think that's realistic. And I said down here, 40%. If you feel that's too high, let me know. But what would you think it would be if we went from 25%, what do you think you would commit to and say you would do? 35. I'll buy that. And I'm going to keep the closing rate of BBACs at 50%. And by the way, number of deals is, is running at 80%. I'm not going to change that either. What I want to show you what would happen is, if you did nothing else, if you did nothing else in the next year, did nothing else but improve the way you work customers today, this is what would happen. That's the inventory turn, by the way, from four turn, which is what a typical uh, independent does, to 5.2. And look at the retail, from 49.4 to 65, without increasing, without increasing traffic by one person. Simply doing a better job with the people you already have. Doing a better job following up with customers that already visited your dealership. So in 2011-2012, I can't promise you you'll increase your floor traffic. No way. Probably not going to happen. But ask yourself, can I manage my sales team? Can I manage processes whereby we would do a better job with every single customer we have? And if a customer leaves my dealership, other than a thank you note, what could we do differently to get that customer to come back into our dealership to get these kind of results? And by the way, if you did go to, just by doing a better job here, just do a better job of those customers that you have. So in a highly competitive market, quit chasing and start chasing yourself and the things that you can do inside the dealership.
Yes. The question is, why does inventory turn rate go up? First of all, you're selling more. Okay? You're selling more, and you can sell more in a shorter period of time. We didn't increase your traffic any, but you'll find you're selling more cars in a shorter period of time. It increases turn. And that's what really impacts right here, your expense, why, one of the major reasons why it reduces your expenses by over $100,000. And your advertising expense goes from 13%, as you see here, down to 8%, or $282 per car down to $171, just by doing a better job managing your business. So I'm not here to tell you how to get more traffic. I can't promise that. Anyone who tells you they can is a fool. There's no program out there you can buy that'll get more people walking through your door just because you want it to happen. But you do have control over how each guest, when they walk in your dealership, is approached. You have control over that. And just because you've got guys with you for 10, 15, 20 years, don't make the assumption they've got the experience. And oftentimes we are very blind by saying, well, my people know what to do with customers. They've been with me for a long period of time. The fact of the matter is, they know what to do with customers in a good economy, which anyone can. But do they really know what to do with guests in a bad economy? And this is a fact here. When we take a look at how much more expensive it is to go after new customers, and why it's mathematically possible to sell more cars than you've ever sold before and still not make the money because of the cost to sell increases dramatically. I fly Delta because they give me points. When I choose to fly, fly places, I make sure I try to find a way to find a Delta so I can upgrade it automatically. They don't have to advertise to me. They reward me for my loyalty. How do you reward your customers for their loyalty? Do you think if you call a customer up and gave them a set of free wiper blades every year? Better than oil change. Absolutely. Think about that. And by the way, you put them on. Don't charge them a half hour for install. <laughs> That's a half hour labor. <laughs> we made money on it, Joe. <laughs> and by the way, if a customer buys from you again, you're going to make higher gross. You don't make money on a new guy walking through the door. Why is he buying from you in the first place? How did you get the business? Coupons. If I could, you would you? What's it going to take? If I can put another 200 in your trade, will you do business? If I can get your payments too, will you do business? So the way we close the first guy is by bribing and incentivizing. Retained customers give us higher gross profit margins. Why? Because they like us and they love us. I've done a lot of math in trying to figure this thing out. I'm very blessed to have been married to and am married to a mathematician. My wife has her master's degrees in, in, uh, in math. And I was sitting down and we were trying to figure this out. How much more gross would a dealer actually make through certain retention? And what we discovered was if a dealership can retain, if a dealership can retain just 5%, just 5%, just 5 more of its customer base, they would generate 80% more gross through higher gross profits. That's all you have to do. The problem is you don't know what your customer retention may be right now today. What percentage of your business actually is retained? Once you get that number, figure out if I can increase it just 5% through better selling, better processes of keeping up with the customer, I'll make more gross profit. There's Tim coming up in the future. I'll appraise that one, yeah? <laughs> yeah. There's Timmy appraising one. When we think about retained customers, retained customers give us higher gross profits. And by the way, retained customers, aren't they much easier to close? Yeah. How, many, how many hours does it take to close a brand new customer? What's the average time? Four hours. Four hours. Four hours. How long does it take you to close a retained customer? 30 minutes. The rest of the time is just shooting a breeze with them, right? But think about how much time you waste every day just closing people, trying to convince them that you're the place to do business with. And while you're spending all that time trying to close them, what are you not doing? You're not selling someone else. 
Have you ever witnessed customers leave your dealership because they weren't waited on? Ever happened to anybody? And have you lost customers because a salesman tried to wait on three people at the same time? And you lost all three? Think about it. You lose customers not because you're bad, but because you're poor time management. You're not focusing on the customer who can be sold very quickly so you can sell another one. And by the way, you've set yourself. When one of your salesmen sells a car and they want to sit down and eat lunch, what have you told them? Get out there and sell another one. That's the easiest time while you're pumped up and jazzed up. Did you ever tell them that? Don't relax. You're still on the high. <laughs> All right, remember that? 